So, um, so today's workshop um, is focused around warehousing. So we will introduce you to the concept of warehousing. Uh, you will come to understand the role that warehousing plays within the broader supply chain framework. Okay, you'll understand that supply chain in simple definition is from the time we extract something from mother nature to the time it is transformed into a finished goods and to the time it is consumed by you as the consumer and possibly returning to mother earth either in the form of recycling. So that's how broad supply chain is. And we refer to the term end-to-end -end supply chain, okay, which covers, they call it from the farm to the fork. So essentially extracting something from Mother Nature all the way to con being consumed by you and me. So we will also cover the various processes and procedures that make up warehousing. Um, we will introduce you to the basic uh, issues. And I think with us, op with us operating in what we call the fourth industrial environment, um, it's important, you know, right now it's, we, everybody calls it 4IR, which is fourth industrial revolution. And you know that, you know, our entire lives have been consumed by the rate of digitalization. Everything we do operates on a digital platform. Uh, who would have thought years ago that we could be conducting an online training platform like what we're doing right now? So we will try and show you how technology is impacting warehousing, okay? And I think it's important, you know, I always ask my students um, in every decision you make, always put on, I call it the financial hat or the finance hat. Always try and understand the decisions that you make. What is the cost impact? You know, um, warehousing should not be done as an operational function. Try and understand the financial impact of your decision. Okay. And then we will close up with uh, metrics or key performance indicators. Uh, how do you manage your warehouse to know whether it's hot or not. So that's important. You know, we know that anything you manage, you got to measure because if it's not being measured, you cannot manage it. And if you cannot manage it, it leads to chaos. So we will close with controls. Okay. So I think, I think we always like to give our students a very uh, quick recap on supply chain. So you'll know that supply chain is essentially made up of five vital cogs in the wheel. Um, you'll know that everything, as everything starts off with a plan. So you may have a bottle of um, mineral water, or a bottle of water, or you may have a chocolate on your desk. Uh, remember that chocolate lying on your desk all started off with a plan. So that means the manufacturer who produced or who made that chocolate let's let's use the chocolate bar that's lying on your desk if you don't have one don't feel bad you can get one after lunch okay but let's use that chocolate bar on your desk that chocolate bar on your desk did not appear there by randomly it appeared there because of these aspects of the supply chain so the company for example, Nestle had to plan. They had to look at what the demand for that chocolate was. They had to understand, right, how do we translate that demand into an order? In order for us to make that chocolate, what materials we required in the form of raw materials such as cocoa. And when we think of cocoa and when we think of uh, raw materials, we can be grateful to our colleague there in, in Ghana, Benedicta, because I know that is one of the sourcing regions for cocoa. 
Um, so you'll know that uh, we had to know what packaging materials we needed. So all that goes into the planning phase of supply chain, taking that demand for chocolates, putting it into a production plan, using our materials plan to try and understand what we need to make that chocolate. And then obviously next to plan, we move into source because when you have identified what needs or the requirements, you need to source it. So that's when we go into uh, to our buyers and our procurement team and we source the materials, raw materials, packaging materials, whatever it takes to make that chocolate bar. We source it from different regions. And then once we source it, once we receive the raw materials, we make the product. So we have factories and in factories, we have various processes, uh, which includes quality. And then once we make that product, we deliver it. We deliver it to warehouses. We deliver it to distribution centers. And from there, it ends up in the hands of the consumer. And that is how that chocolate bar supposedly is lying on your desk. Now, very closely linked to that, we have the fifth cog in the wheel, which talks of returns. Because we do know that somewhere along these cogs, there will be what is called returns more commonly known as reversal logistics. So that means somewhere along the line, maybe the warehouse received the chocolates that were either damaged or maybe past the expiry date. Now that has to go back. It has to go back to the factory. The factory may have to make a decision in terms of do we rework this chocolate? Hopefully not. Uh, do we dump this chocolate? whatever decision needs to be made. So you'll see it's a linked process. That's why you'll see supply chain is a very linked process. It happens, it's a very iterative process. So it's happening in synchronization with one another. Now, that was to give you a quick link or a quick view of supply chain. Now, we need to understand since what we are studying this morning or this afternoon is warehouses. We need to try and understand where does warehouses fit within the supply chain, okay? And we use, we use a very simple diagram. So you'll see that we have, everything starts, as I said, you at Mother Earth. It can be in the form of raw materials. So whether it's a supplier of raw materials or semi-processed materials, but it starts at the supplier and the supplier himself as warehouses. Remember, the supplier is the customer to his supplier. Likewise, you are the customer to your supplier. It's a very iterative process. So that's why we talk of suppliers, supplier, and we talk of customer's customer because everybody is part of this link. So in this stage, even the supplier may have certain warehouses to store his raw materials, which he then converts to his finished goods, okay? And then he puts it into his warehouse and then he will supply you as the customer. Now, remember, you as the customer, you have your own factory, okay? But even before you can start producing this product, normally what happens is preceding to your factory, you will have a warehouse to store your product. This is where your warehouse will serve as what we call a buffer zone. Remember, in as much, in as much as we try to supply just in time, okay? Just in time is where a supplier will supply just as the factory requires the item. Now, you may ask if the supplier can supply just in time to 
the factory. You may ask yourself, is there a need? Okay. You may ask yourself, if the supplier is supplying directly to the factory using the concept of just in time. Yeah. And I'm sure many of you would have heard of the concept of just in time. It's essentially saying the factory requires what it needs when it needs and in the quantity that it needs. Okay. So in as much as many organizations strive for a just-in-time supply, and one of the reasons is either to minimize a warehouse or to eliminate a warehouse. Because as you will learn later, warehouse can be a very cost-effective or a very cost-competitive function. So you will know, yes, you know, the Japanese are leaders in just-in-time systems. You know, I had the privilege of spending time in Japan under the Toyota factories and understanding how they have mastered this just-in-time concept. So essentially in Toyota, they have very small warehouses. If not, they have no warehouses because the component suppliers will supply from their factory directly to the Toyota production lines. Okay, so you can see that sort of makes the, um, what can I say, that, that sort of shows that you don't need a warehouse. Now, I say this with much respect. Okay, because even the Toyota just-in-time systems have changed over the last few years. If you look at 12 years ago, what happened in uh, the Toyota Fukushima plant, which was a nuclear plant in Fukushima, that basically there was an earthquake, and a few months later there was a tsunami, and then there was radiation, uh, leakage and that entire area of Japan was basically cut off from the rest of the world. So that means if you learnt to use only the just in time system, you were basically crippled. Reason being, that supplier could no longer supply you just in time. So even Toyota has now learnt the importance of using warehouses. So you'll see warehouses have now, in as much as we have just-in-time systems, warehouses are there to serve as buffer. So that if there is a delay any, between supplier and customer, the warehouse can compensate for that gap. Okay, I just thought I would use that as an example to explain to you why we keep warehouses in as much as we are moving to various different platforms. Warehouses will remain. Warehouses will be required along different times of the operation. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on to understand that the factory will make the product using the raw materials from the warehouse. The factory will then dispatch the product either to a distribution center. Uh, another name that we like to use for a distribution center is called a mother warehouse. So this can either be a, um, a massive warehouse that stores products for different factories within the same group. So for example, Unilever uh, prior to 2010 had about 24 different warehouses across South Africa and um, different products were stored in different warehouses. But essentially um, in 2010, the company moved to uh, the mother warehouse concept where they built two huge warehouses a 45,000 square meter facility in Peter Maritzburg and a 90,000 square meter facility 
in Jet Park in Johannesburg. So essentially, they collapsed that 24 warehouses into two mother warehouses, into two distribution centers. And that's where seven of Unilever factories will deliver the product into these two distribution centers. And then these distribution centers will then deliver to a customer warehouse, okay? They will deliver to a clicks warehouse or whether it's a pick and pay warehouse or they will deliver to various destination points until the product arrives at the customer, okay? So this is where you will find warehouses within the supply chain. What you keep in them is diverse. You can keep finished goods, you can keep raw materials, you can keep semi-completed uh, materials, you can keep components, any product can be kept in warehouses and we'll go, we'll go through it at a later stage in terms of what we keep in these warehouses. Now, you will, you will, you will understand that the supply chain, as I showed you earlier, is made up of diverse nodes we like to call these as nodes so you'll see there's different nodes at different points of the supply chain okay so there's linkages between suppliers you'll know i mean in your industry as you mentioned some of you are working in different types of industries you are serviced by a multitude of suppliers there's various suppliers that then deliver to you you may be the manufacturing plant, um, and then you take those components, you make them into a product uh, that needs to be delivered to a warehouse. You deliver it to multiple warehouses, and then it eventually ends up in the market, which is the consumer. So what's important to understand is within this network, we can make it either very simple, or we can make it either very complex. Um, and it's your job. It's your job as a supply chain practitioner, as you acquire more skills to start simplifying this network. Because uh, sometimes by default, sometimes by design, these networks can become overcomplicated. That's why we try and impart knowledge to practitioners like you, so that when you go back into your organizations, you know, you start unpacking your network and you ask yourself, just how complex is my network? Are there opportunities within which to unpack my network? You know, uh, for example, uh, once we produce the product, once it's manufactured in our world, in our factory, uh, we're distributing to maybe 20 warehouses. Is that the best decision? You remember I shared with you earlier, always put on the hat of a finance person. In as much as you are in operations, ask yourself, is this the best uh, decision from a financial perspective? You know, should we not reduce the number of warehouses? Should we not um, standardize certain operations and certain procedures so that we can deliver savings to the business? Should we not reduce the amount of stock that we're keeping in the warehouse? So these are some of the questions that you need to continually ask yourself. Remember, the warehouse is a dynamic environment. It's constantly changing. Remember, everything that we do within the private sector we do for the customer. We do it as part of our responsibility to deliver exceptional customer service. And remember, without a customer, you would not exist. So ask yourself, am I giving the customer what the customer wants, when the customer wants, and in the quantities the customer wants? Because everything hinges on customer service. Because you know, you as only as good as the last delivery. If your delivery does not go in line with the customer's expectations, he's going to start looking very quickly for somebody else to supply him with that product. So always ask yourself, do I have customer service at 
the front of my strategy. Okay, so you'll know. I mean, right now, over the last three years uh, from COVID, you'll know that many of you, in fact, every one of us has bought something through the digital platform, through e-commerce. You know that. You've either bought a meal through Uber Eats or Mr. D, or you bought something through Amazon, or you bought something to some platform, loot, you name it. And you know when you experienced poor customer service. You know the complaints. You know the phone calls that you made. You know the emails that you sent to complain. So in the same vein, if you deliver poor customer service, your customers are going to run away. So remember, remember the importance of keeping your customer service at an all-time eye whilst managing costs. Okay. So we're going to move. We're going to move into two systems. And you're going to, you're going to hear these two systems ever so often in your daily interaction as a warehouse, as a supply chain practitioner. And we're going to ask a question. I think this is an important time just to open up the, 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 the mic. Uh, if anybody could tell us what is your understanding of a push system versus a pull system. So we're going to try and get some feedback. So we also hear your voice a little here. So yeah, let's have a quick chat. Um, let's invite our participants and try and gain very quickly. What is your understanding of a push system versus a pull system? If you've heard it before. Any, any volunteers? So welcome, um, welcome, yeah. Uh, Celine, I would like to try. Yes, let's go for it, Banele. All right, um, I think the push system will be a system whereby um, the supply is driven by the demand. So that will be the push system and then, oh no, the pull system rather. And then the push system will be just like, um, producing just in case if like the demand uh, will be uh, available. Excellent, excellent. Well done there, Banele. I'm gonna right. comment, but I think I'm gonna ask for one more, um, one more viewpoint, and then I will comment on what you've just said, yeah? Um, let's take another view, guys, Is anybody? So we're excited, we joined by uh, Ahmed Joe and uh, also Notando so, and Linda Lani. So welcome guys, excellent to see more people joining us. Let's try and understand from any one of you in terms of what's your understanding of a push system versus a pull system. Okay, is there any takers? Um, hello. Yes, let's go for it. Uh, Linda Lani. Yes, um, for me, I think it's just the first time hearing it, but um, I'd like to maybe agree with my brother, because uh, uh, in, in your point, plus for me, it's like the first time hearing about uh, the source of push and pull system. Okay. Yeah. So, so you agree? You agree with Vanilla? <laughs> Okay, lovely, lovely. So um, let's cross across. Uh, I mean, yeah, let's cross over the Atlantic and go to Regina. Uh, Tolulupa, let's let's get your viewpoint coming in um, from that across the Atlantic. What do you think? Okay, um, just as the um, other speaker said, I think post system is is demand driven really because when you do your research and you figure out what it's in demand for your product that will help you to determine how you handle your warehousing and even production from scratch um, while the push system is basically just 
maybe after your market research, you get the products done with the hope that you'll be able to push them into the um, system whereby uh, it gets to buyers um, at the end of the chain. Excellent. I think, um, well done. Well done to the three respondents. I think they've summed it up very nicely. Uh, yes, a pool system is primarily demand driven. So the pool system is a, what I'd like to call a voluntary system that responds to demand. So the pool system will start, if you look at that supply chain process, will start the search or the sourcing of products based on the demand plan that it expects from the organization. Uh, it will only start once it gets the forecast of what the organization wants, and it will go out and find the products and make the products based on the demand. So that's correct. Pool system is driven primarily by demand, as opposed to the push system, which on the opposite spectrum, the push system will generally work to capacity. So the push system will say, right, I've got a machine in this factory that is capable of producing 100,000 widgets on a daily basis. Uh, I am driven primarily by operational efficiency. I want this machine sweating. If we use manufacturing language, we want this machine to sweat. We want 100,000 from this machine, irrespective of what the demand is. So essentially, that's what push and pull is. So one driven by supply and the other driven by demand. So you'll see, we're gonna be crisscrossing this demand and supply a lot. Um, even in this warehousing module, as we go along, we're gonna talk more and more about it, okay? So you might ask, why? Why is it important? Um, remember, a warehouse has finite capacity. That means you can only put so much of pallets into a warehouse. You cannot put more than what the warehouse was designed, what the warehouse was specced for. So if you do not understand whether you have a pull strategy or a push strategy, ultimately you're going to end up in a situation where your warehouse is going to be full and you're not going to be able to accommodate additional product. And then you start looking for alternate spaces and then you start incurring costs that could have been circumvented at the outset. Okay. And we're going to cover that quite in detail. Now, guys, very importantly, when we talk about supply chain network, you'll understand that the supply chain network, um, you know, I always tell my, my student, if I could use one word um, to sum up supply chain network, it's relationships. You do not operate as a silo in supply chain. You operate through relationships. You operate via relationships with your supplier with your supplier's supplier, with your customer, with your customer's customer, with stakeholders. Your stakeholders could be the community in which you operate. So, you know, are you operating in a responsible manner as a supply chain company? Are you sourcing materials responsibly? Are you disposing of materials responsibly? So it's very interconnected. So supply chain is such an exciting, and I, you know, I was so excited in the poll uh, when the result was that 67% of you people do not operate in supply chain, but you're keen to learn. I can tell you proudly as a, uh, as a supply chain practitioner that supply chain is, I wouldn't say it's evolving, I'll say it's growing at a frenetic pace. It's growing with so much of excitement. I mean, you know, you guys are LinkedIn professionals and you'll see, you'll see everything about supply chain uh, 
the companies are sharing. So you'll see it's an exciting space to be because of its interconnectedness. I mean, data that is important to you is data that is important to a supplier. Because if you can share that data with a supplier, how much more effective can that supplier become in producing your requirements? Yeah, but you'll see that it involves a little bit of a mature relationship. Supply chains need professionals that don't think short term. You need to be thinking long term. You need to be thinking of long term benefits for all stakeholders down the supply chain. Okay, supply chain is about visibility, especially now that we are operating with so much of. Um, I call it the internet of things. You know, we call it big data. Uh, we call it machine learning. Uh, there's so much of technology that can help us to expand on the visibility of supply chain. I mean, right now, some of you may be waiting for a product that you bought online. And I'm sure that if you bought it through a reputable company, they will tell you exactly where that product is in the supply chain. They will give you an anticipation of when that product will apply. So it's all visibility. And, and you need to be asking yourself, you know, do we have visibility in our supply chain or does it happen when it happens? Am I only informed of something when it happens? So that means there's opportunity for you to increase visibility, okay? As I said, it's connected. That means it's supplier, it's uh, customers, it's everybody within the links. And you need, you need to look at, are we talking to one another? Are we talking to one another? Are we sharing information? Um, do we have shared platforms? Or are you still using a distant approach? you know, from your stakeholders? Uh, are you afraid to share information because you feel that, you know, if I share information, I'm letting out secrets. So we need to advance to a more mature relationship in supply chain because it's going to drive efficiency for both you and your supplier, for both you and your customer. So these are some of the salient things that you need to understand when you studying supply chain, when you're unpacking supply chain within your organization. Um, it's, it's an innovative field, which means right now, even as we speak, there's some new app that's being created to, to improve uh, supply chain. It means right now, whether you're in the bank or whether you're in a manufacturing arena, some change is happening at a fast pace. Somebody's finding new ways. I mean, all you got to do is just look at what happened during COVID. The number of apps that were developed during COVID to try and increase the efficiency of supply chains has outpaced itself. I think the number of apps that were created during COVID and after COVID is far in excess of what was created even before COVID. So COVID was the game changer. It forced us to do things differently. You know, during COVID, there was massive shipping line issues. Borders were closed. So that means if you were sourcing from overseas destinations, your product couldn't move. You had to look at innovative ways of getting your product. You know, whether you chartered a plane, there were some organizations with budgets that chartered cargo planes just to get the products. So this is all about innovation. This is all about forward thinking, okay? And ultimately, it's about how do you constantly improve the supply chain? Uh, the Japanese have a wonderful word. They call it continuous improvement. They call it Kaizen. So Kaizen is how do we constantly shift how do we constantly improve things, no matter how big? So the good thing about Kaizen, they are not looking at, you know, uh, big picture thinking. They're not looking at, wow, you know, we, we want to be the next Tesla, you know, where we want to send people to space. <laughs> or we, you know, we don't want to be the next uh, space. We want to be... 
improving chain network. Okay. So guys, I think we did a lot of intro and I did say I want to stick to the housekeeping um, in terms of giving you the comfort break. So remember the first part was about showing you total supply chain, then sort of bringing in warehouse into it. But I think let's take a break. It's now 10.35. Let's regroup at 10.50, 15 minute break, coffee break. And when we come back, let's understand or let's continue with um, the role that warehouses play, okay, within the logistics. Is that good enough for you? Yeah, no, it's okay. Yes, perfect. Thank you. All right, let's take a break. <laughs> 